This demonstration will be a medieval brew a little later from the Viking brew, the stone brew that I did um, previously with the hot rocks. This uses a copper kettle, so first I need to build my stove. And for the purpose of demonstration, I have a little portable stove, semi-portable because it's still heavy. And because the, my um, kettle is not a very large diameter, I had to cut down the stones to get a mostly um, tight cylinder for the stove. If I just use the, stove to, uh, the stones the way they were, in their rectangular shape, then I had very large air gaps and I was losing a lot of heat in between those slits. So we cut them off at a 26 degree angle, that is a 7 stone radius, which works well with my little copper kettle. And I'll put it together for you now. It's nice to start, already start with an even floor, as the more even you start, the easier it'll get adding the new layers. I found it doesn't need a whole lot of wood to keep going but to heat up a kettle of water um, right out of the well which is cold cold water that does need a little bit of uh, oomph so the first kettle to boil will take a bit the second one will be quite significantly faster So the water is getting a temperature, we're at 180, so that's perfect for meshing. I don't need to do a boiling clean here because we are going to boil the wort later. And since I am doing a medieval uh, instead of dark cage technique, I will be using a false bottom instead of juniper. And my false bottom is a plank with holes in that goes in the bottom of my mesh tan. Line up the holes. And there, that would be it. But 
for some added um, filtering security I will be putting a little bit of um, uh, probably a little a handful of straw straw is often used as a filtering agent up until um, his, like modern historic times as well so I'll grab a little bit of hay I'll put my filter bed in and then it's time to start meshing Wow, that wooden filter makes a really nice bottom. Already have foam starting to happen. It's also starting to smell sweet. Mm. So normally if I would do this on my stove, my meshing water, my strike water would be around 170 to end at 160. But I found last week that when I did that in this setup, it didn't work it went down to 150 140 so i'm st i was thinking i might actually need a 20 degree difference not a 10 degree difference and from what i'm seeing here that's exactly what happened because this now is doing really really well this is what i was expecting Beautiful foaming. I didn't overly worry about cleaning my brew fat because this is a two-step brewing process I'm demonstrating this time. Not a one-step, so I'm not Heating, mashing and lottering in one ton. I'm heating in my copper kettle. I'm mashing and lottering in my, in my ton. 
but then I am drawing off the wort to go back in my copper kettle to boil because this is a later medieval um, recipe which uses hops and by the 13th 14th century 13th century the Germanic brewers the brewers in Germany they had figured out isomerization they figured out that if you boil hops for a length of period you get a much better preservative liquor but for that you needed kettles because you need to actually get your wort and boil it though for a while and we still see that in farmhouse brewing what you can also do is make a separate hop tea but what I'm seeing from the later, the early modern renaissance recipes, they were boiling wort. They weren't making separate wort tea. Of course, by that time, we're also talking about larger commercial outfits. Larger commercial outfits with larger kettles and the ability to do this on a much larger scale with equipment that the regular homestead brewer would not have had access to. Okay, I'm going to, oh, it's nice and warm. The rings on the outside of my tongue are warm, so that's a good sign. I'm having a little bit of steam from up here, so. Yep, and that was 180. So how hot are you? Perfect. I don't know if you can see it, but that's 160. So indeed, do it in a ton. Have your strike water at 180, then when you mesh it in here, it'll be 160. So I'm going to quickly cover this to keep the warmth in. So we're talking about we're talking about brewing without thermometers. I actually knew last time when I was brewing something wasn't going right because I wasn't getting the right steaming on the top of my uh, my mesh. I didn't need the thermometer to know that something was not right. And I'm pretty sure that that experience, and I only have a wee bit of experience, so if I pick it up, I'm sure that the uh, medieval brewers with tons of experience would have no problem whatsoever. Yep. So my mesh is slowly incubating, nice and warm. And for future reference, I have probably about two gallons of water left in here. So one kettle is more than enough to mesh in my 20 pounds. I'm going to take the kettle, empty the kettle off because I had a little bit of a leakage in the back that I can fix, that I did fix last time as well. So I'm going to do that momentarily and show you how. So when I bought this kettle, second hand, from far away, I was told that it was dented and ugly, but that it also was waterproof. But it um, didn't leak, no holes. And of course, by the time I bought it and had it here, there were two holes. So with Sammy, you clean them up, you find the hidden flaws. So I have one hole here and one hole there. They're not holes per se, they are pairs. So something bumped in it and it tore through the copper. Copper is fairly uh, pliable, so it's not that hard to do. Don't 
have the opportunity right now to get it fixed professionally. I know people who can do that, but with COVID, I don't have the traveling that I need to do that. And there are no events, no way of meeting them somewhere else. But I do have this. This is my little medieval glue stick. It is a combination of charcoal, horsehair and pitch, pine pitch. All of them are um, okay to put in food. I wouldn't eat it, but it's not gonna harm you, just like the copper. And this makes a good, not a permanent, but a good enough for a one-time brew. So I did it last time, it worked perfectly, but I also found that when I was heating the water, it wasn't as tight as I liked it. So it looks like I have to redo this every single time I do a prolonged brew. I don't mind about for heating water, but I do mind losing my wort. So we want this, just like a marshmallow, we want this to become hot and malleable. You'll see it gets all shiny and poofy, but not flame. Another reason that I couldn't do this until I was actually until I actually had hot coals because you need a good indirect heat. So. And that should be enough. So let it cool down just a wee bit. I'll put the, I'll fill the kettle up with water and put it back on. So keep in mind with copper kettles you can never heat them dry. They always have to have liquid in. Do never put it on the fire and think, oh, I'll go grab the water and come back. Um, for one, you might forget something might happen. Stranger things have happened. But also with copper, that does not work. Point flame. You need the dispersed heat. So I'll fill it up a little bit with water and then I'll put it back on and fill it up all the way. Because if I fill it up on the ground, I won't be able to lift it. And then I'll slowly heat this, because I'm not in a big hurry, for my sparge water. And again, that should be at around 160, 180. You want to have it at mesh temperatures. I'm meshing at 160 now. So something like that. I also would like to have some hot water around, because the mesh, the grist is going to soak up water, so my grist is going to get fairly dry. And I would like to add some more, um, probably about half an hour or so. And that'll give me a way to raise up the temperatures, raise the temperature a little bit back up if needed as well. Might not need it. If it needs it, then at least I have the water. It's better to have hot water when you need it. There's no hot water and you find that you do. So we're about halfway through. The mesh is thick and it's getting closer to dipping just below 150. And since I'm halfway, and I had it last time too, so about halfway through. I like to get. A little bit of extra water. And this is sparge temperature. This is 160. So this should get everything right back up for another 45 minutes or so. It's already darkening out. The liquor doesn't look like water, it's definitely um, infusing. It's very sweet smelling. No. 
But another reason I like to have a little bit of liquor on top is that when it clears out, when I have enough room to let it clear out, then I know it's had enough time to rest. And we're getting close, but I've got the whole day, so I'm giving it plenty of time. Beautiful. Just a little over 140, between 140 and 150. So next time I will heat it up again in between, but I will also heat it up a little hotter. It does insulate well the wood, but it doesn't insulate as good as styrofoam. So now we're going to do our first draining. Pretty clean, it's dark. It's a little different parting. I picked the wooden filter which I haven't used before. 
is running up against my um, my closing stick a little bit, my plug. So when I add water, it pushes up against it and dislodges it a little bit. So that is something to keep in mind. I could sparge with another bucket. So normally it's about 40% of the mash water that you can use to sparge. And if I look so at my thumb, that's about it. And I want to end up with a little over 5 gallons, so when I boil it for an hour, I will end up with about 5 gallons. So I should have, on average, you boil away about a gallon per hour on the rolling boil. So once I've got 5 gallons here, I'll put them in. I can do that now too. Okay, because now it's less heavy. So I'll do two half buckets, almost half buckets, end up with six gallons. So I've got about six gallons of wort, nice and dark, and now I am going to be adding my hops and boil it for an hour. By about the 13th century, the brewers in the German area figured out how to boil hops to get the preservative effects. And by the 14th and 15th century, that really spread all over Western Europe. So this is a brew inspired by medieval German hamburger Bremen beer. I'm going to be adding a couple of handfuls of homegrown hop. A bit of a wind. Beautiful. And we'll let that boil in with the liquor. And see if we can get some isomerization out of this. I normally would have done two hands, but my uh, my hops is fairly old. Um, I, I, I did store it in freezer, but still, it's fairly old. And I didn't get a very pronounced flavor of it last time. So I figured I'd do a little bit more. Last time I did half hops, half bog myrtle. But that was a Scandinavian beer. And hops and bog myrtle are both Scandinavian brewing plants. Borg metal would not be so much in the areas of Germany where they were using hops. The areas that were using Borg metal were often locked in using the kraut. 
which is bog myrtle but especially in the in the beginning it didn't have hops as an in ingredient as much and it definitely it didn't boil as far as I can make out um, cloud beer was a raw ale like farmhouse ale and I'll be doing one of those too but that'll be in a while because I'm not sure if we're gonna get any nice brewing weather the 70 degrees in mid-november is not usual so i'm very happy i could squeeze in just one more brew so once this comes to a boil i'll start the one hour we should have a about a gallon of volume uh, reduction from the heating at a rolling boil. I have a, a little bit more of the work here, but this is all the last stuff. And what I've been doing is make uh, just beer soda out of it. Uh, put it in a flip top bottle with a little bit of uh, beer, uh, bread yeast, a little tiny pinch of bread yeast. And it makes actually a nice mold soda. But this is supposed to be alcoholic beer. So there's a little bit of a question whether this would be, how plausible this setup would be. It is very efficient. I've seen similar setups, although with much bigger capitals, in uh, Finnish farmhouse brewing. And the idea is that Finnish and uh, other Scandinavian farmhouse brewing is uh, reminiscent of the old European farmhouse brewing that didn't survive. Um, European farmhouse brewing or the manor brewing, a little bit is found in, uh, in England, but there isn't very much in Dutch and German low country context as when the hop brewing, 13th century hop brewing, that's also when the people started to move into cities. You get more people in a smaller area, people started to, uh, certain household tasks became jobs, professions, and brewing, which was a women's household task, became a man's profession, a commercial profession. And that means it's upskill. So this is a household version. Um, fairly quickly, brewing would have been much, much larger scale. And it had to keep longer, which actually is also where the crowd comes in. Because regular stovetop farmhouse brewing was consumed within a couple of days, make small amounts. Maybe one week one would brew and then another week another person would brew and sell or share throughout the community. Um, we've seen that in traditional Scandinavian context as well. But in general, it doesn't have to travel, it doesn't have to keep for very long because it's consumed before it goes sour, before it goes bad. And for commercial brewing, for sales in inns, um, larger scale, a little bit of preservative effect was uh, was needed. Uh, that's where the craft comes in, which also became a very, very good way of um, levying attacks on the production of beer. This is not specifically a way the way that a kruid beer would have been made, because that would have made a concentrated cased porridge, a grain in malt extract first that has preservative herbs, and then that would have been added to the wort when it came out. So there's no boiling. The added sugars, which are fortifying the wort, would boost the fermentable sugars, boost the alcohol by volume, and the, the bork myrtle, the laurel berries, the laser wood, the resin, a lot of pine resin was used, um, would preserve the wort. 
would preserve the fermentation. Uh, but it preserved the resulting beer just enough so it could be regionally traded and drunk. It wasn't until the well, invention, one might say, of hop brewing, hop beer brewing, that out of region commercial brewing became a thing and then it became a big thing and then it became national and then it became international and before we knew it we had German beer in the Netherlands or low countries and it outcompeted the craft beer in certain areas pretty quickly. So we'll keep adding fuel to the firebox. It's doing good. Yep, it's doing good. And once it's up to a rolling boil, we'll start the countdown. It looks really good. It smells fantastic. When the steam starts to roll around like that, little bits at a time, I'm finding that's a good visual indicative of it being around 160 Fahrenheit. When it becomes a complete blanket of that, that we're getting close to 180. Where continuous steam is pretty indicative that we're getting to 180. Once we start getting foam, covered in foam, then we're getting close to the boiling point. And we're at about 200 degrees now. So it's another good visual reminder of what is happening. So we've got a boil, a nice rolling boil, so I'll stoke it up with a little less wood but a little more often, keep it at a rolling boil without scorching. And then we're ready to decant it into our fermenting bucket and cool it down. This is a surprise for me too. Okay, so a bunch of grain went around the edges, but that's why I had these two. They kept most of the edge from going into the middle, so that actually did work. I've been thinking of putting in some channels, but I have to do with the handsaw, and I haven't done that yet. And considering the flow, I'm not sure I even have to. It flowed fine. Oh, and there's a lot of sediment down here. Yep. Actually, not even a lot. I had more with the previous brew. So this is where I put... Ah, look. So I've got a little bit of sediment on the outside of my straw, but nothing around here. Good! So this combination works. And probably if I had a better fitting filter, I wouldn't need the little bit of straw, but one could never... <laughs> I'm not a very good woodworker, so having it fit to begin with, I was very happy. Oop. 
Next will be hosing it out so I can scrub it out and bring it back home. I won't be able to have it in the sun like I did between the previous brews. I had it in the sun for a few days but the, like I said this is the last nice day forecasted for this fall. It's 70 degrees. It's absolutely beautiful. A little overcast would have been nicer for you guys because the contrast makes it a bit uh, hard to see. Um, in the middle of the day with the sun because we had sun all day beautiful blue skies But hey If I have to choose between 40 degree weather and overcast and 70 degree weather with uh, full Sun In November, I think I know which one I'll take so I'm gonna hose this down get all the gunk out and then transport it back up to the garage to let it dry out Almost time to start putting that in the fermenting bucket and I must say that this new type of brewing, this is the second time I brew with the kettle, it's a little trickier in keeping the temperature right. The hot rock method is actually very straightforward and, uh, and quite efficient but once I figured that out it's actually a little faster because I can just put the hot water in and mesh in straight away. I don't have to do the step mashing, step it up. Probably the meshing itself would be faster in the sense that I've got a longer period to build up to it. But that's different ways of brewing. Um, so something I wanted to share with you guys, so this is a new thing to me, and I must say that I'm quite taken with it. Though I must say that it's still got little pieces of grain and everything in, so it'll never be completely clean. I don't think using a filter plunk is something that you want to use with um, raw ale brewing. And while I've seen filter sticks to raise the juniper bed up, I haven't seen actual filter planks like I've read descriptions about for European medieval brewing. And one of the reasons I suddenly when I started doing the cleanup, I think that is because you can't quite get them clean. You can get them clean enough and once you boil, put boiling water over and all that, it'll be sanitized enough to do a brew with, but because we're boiling the wort after it is a lot less um, necessary to be completely sterile so I'm starting to think that the use of filter plunker like this one might also mean that it's connected to boiling the wort I'm not sure how yeah how easy infected this will infect a raw ale brew but man, it's easy to do. And if I, maybe someday I'll, I'll find someone who could do an, 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 an exact replica of the bottom of my barrel, make it a little uh, more fitting. But yeah, with a little bit of straw and this, no need to go out and grab juniper. No need to put it all down. It's just put the thing down, stick it in, and we're ready to go. So yeah, but it's definitely efficient. Always like checking out new equipment. Now I've got a new toy. Another toy to keep clean. Thank you. 
Okie doke, one five gallon bucket, just as predicted. Hmm, I'm getting the hang of this. And I still have some wood left over for next experiment. <laughs>